So let's take advantage and um, and pick something. Also, I want to say that one of the things we don't do at BIC, especially with our clients, we our platform is not majorly for experiment. I will still address that on the major forum. So we we only bring to bear what we've practiced so that you can eat the ground running. There's something called the switch approach to how we train and what we do. Now, you may not understand how light comes on. Um, can, the, can the slide be in, uh, what do you call it, mode? Um, where am I sharing it? You, you, may, you may not understand, you know, what uh, light emitting the world, all the intricacies of that and what of you. But you understand how to flip the light, get the light that you need, then switch it off. All these things can be understood easily. As long as you get that done and you hit the ground running, yeah, you can have your production. So we'll quickly be running through plant deficiency and plant nutrition. We have taken this, if you're in this group, you are, you've been a part of this either online, especially for those who are privileged to be on site for the training. But I kept seeing quite a lot of people asking questions about plant nutrition and they just say, how do I mix nutrients? How do I do this? Let me say, there are a lot of things on the social media, sorry, yes, on social media, on the internet, blah, blah, blah. But based on what is available, especially to those who are Nigerians, we have compiled uh, the, the, the nutrients that will be mentioned um, in this presentation. Can go to the next slide. And um, so... We will be centering our work around this. So I want to say welcome to the world of hydroponics. Yeah, you are already an hydroponics practitioner. You already know that hydroponics means water works. And you also now understand the difference between pure hydroponics and soilless culture. Pure hydroponics is when you uh, water it, the only medium that you are using. If you're in Lagos, every time you drive on the Todd Mailan Bridge and you see those water hyacinth growing, that's pure hydroponics in nature. Pure hydroponics is you mix liquid nutrient in water and you give it to the plants and the plant root grow out of your nutrient. So pure hydroponics supports systems like NFT, you should know what NFT means by now. Nutrient film technique system supports floating bed system, uh, ebb and flow. Pure hydroponic supports all that system. Uh, pure hydroponic supports practice system. Yeah. Now, soilless culture. Soilless culture is when you have a substrate, a substrate that you're working with. A substrate, we have organic and inorganic substrate. You all know that. But uh, cocoa peat is the substrate. Rice husk is the substrate. A mixture of both cocoa peat, rice husk, uh, boucher, and some other things are all substrate. And you know why substrate is important. Substrates must have three major characteristics. It must have a good water holding capacity. So it must not be poor in water holding capacity. Substrate uh, must, uh, must be porous. Why porosity? So that it can allow oxygen. Remember, without oxygen at the root zone, plants cannot uptake nutrients. Please mute, mute, uh, um, uh, please mute somebody. Just somebody should be checking the attendance or like you said everybody should be 
joining muted. Thank you. Um, porosity without, if your substrate is not porous, oxygen will not move well in the substrate. And if oxygen does not move well, nutrient cannot be uptaken by the plant. And then we have cation exchange capacity of the substrate, which means nutrient can change hands. You know by now we have positively charged nutrient called cations and negatively charged nutrient called anions, which change hands and makes um what do you call it? Um and um, and makes things like this and makes nutrient movement possible. So I'm sure we all understand that. So you know what hydroponics is and what have you. Can we have the next slide? So today we we majorly be focusing on nutrition. Um, everything is about nutrition, which I think we really need to understand. There is something called folic acid. Many of us must have heard about folic acid. But you don't really take folic acid, or do you? Do you? When was the last time you took folic acid as, as a pill? Now, uh, there are certain things that are not done most in certain hospitals. When a child is given birth to, folic acid is that nutrient that helps certain um, organs in the brain to develop. Uh, a child must get it from the mother at birth. If folic acid is deficient in a child and you and is not observed within three days, or within five days, nothing will happen to the child. But that window, a child once a child loses that window, it becomes very difficult to give children this particular nutrient. And what happens is. At certain age in that child's life, five years and thereabout, you will see this major deficiency that there is nothing you can do about it again. It occurs in probably folic acid deficiency, I think occurs in probably one out of 1,000 children given back to there. I can remember the data now. So in most hospitals, especially in advanced country, when the child is given back to, they still give a drop of folic acid to that child. They don't take chances. But adventure that child did not get that from the parent. And these are some of the things that uh, people who, if you are not hearing me, you need to check your mic. I'm sure everybody, can you hear me? If you can hear me, let me just yeah, type yeah, I. Just type I. I can hear you, sir. Well done, clear. Thank you. So if you are not hearing me, you need to check your mic. So as I was saying, these are some of the, thank you. These are some of the, uh, some of the things that those that gives back to children in certain uh, midwife homes, hospitals actually risk. If that child has something like folic acid deficiency, they don't know because they are not given. It, it's not added to them. <clears throat> and later in life, you get to see that this child has certain issues. So nutrient is very, very important. Now, nutrient is not just important. There is timing. <clears throat> timing, the time you give certain nutrients to your crop, it's also very important. Um, like folic acid deficiency, like I said, in humans. It's not something you can give later in life when you now discover that that child does not have it. Even if you give, there will be a lot of issues. The what the brain degradation uh, cannot be recovered. Look at calcium too. If an adult, one of the reasons they encourage that you give children a lot of milk 
so that they can improve or increase their calcium store. Calcium, thank you. Calcium, it's absorbed in humans. And I think animals generally at the early stage in life. The moment you clock or you cross, is it 18 or 21? Your calcium uh, deposit can only be topped. So as a young person, when you take milk, it has a lot of calcium. You eat food with calcium and all that. You are storing your calcium base for your adult years. So if you don't have enough at that young age, when you become an adult, what happens is you now have to be replenishing calcium. And that's why a lot of people that have arthritis issues, certain large percentage of them had calcium deficiency. They didn't take enough at a young age. So they have to be topping it on a daily basis. It cannot be stored again. You have to be taking it. As you take it, you just use it for the moment and, you know, it gets used up and what of you. There, there is a particular uh, animal. That animal lives in the ocean, very cold region. In that region, very hungry predators are available like polar bear and what have you. I think it's the seal. They said the milk of the seal is the richest protein or nutrient in about the entire world. Seal only breastfeeds their, their offspring. Okay, 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 noted. Seal only breastfeeds their offspring, I think, five days. After then, the child is weaned and it goes into the wild by itself. Within that five days, a baby seal, I think, uh, triples in size. It gives back to a child. The, the milk of the seal is very rich. They, they look for it, you know. When you take it, <laughs> yeah, if you are thin and you, and you want to be robust, you know, go and look for the seal milk. You'll be shocked. It's, it's crazy, you know. It's that rich. It is that, you know, deposit of nutrients. So the seal baby takes that milk in five days, it's big enough. It can hunt by itself. It can do so many things by itself. And what I know, it, it set off into the world and it moves. So nutrient is important. When nutrient is taken is important. So today's subject, uh, you know, is of a very high yeah. importance. And then, because well, in my please, please mute, uh, uh, admin, please be on top of this so that we are not distracted. And is it that you cannot um, set up, um, what do you call it, or to mute everyone that is joining? If you can't, so as people are joining, that means you should be checking the participant and be muting everyone. Just put your hand on mute all. Mute all. Thank you. So in hydroponics, because you you we we work in an inert, we use an inert substrate that basically doesn't have any nutrients. So it is what you give the plant that the plant eats and grow with. We need to understand that. So now also, um, excuse me. Now we want to talk about the chemistry of nutrient. The chemistry of nutrient does not change in various growing environment either it is soil either it is medium or it is pure hydroponics let's move to the next uh, plant let me also say something the way nutrient is being fed to is being fed to plant when plant has everything that it needs in its environment Naturally, plant can take what it only needs. There will be issue when what plant needs is not in the environment. Is, is that taken? So there are chemical elements that are essential to the nourishment of plant. Basically, about 17 of them 
And then these 17 are divided into about two categories. We have micro elements. Elements, when I use the word elements, let's understand this. Uh, we are not trying to teach chemistry or advanced class, but elements are each of the nutrients that plant needs. They are called elements. If, if you did science in school, you still remember that uh, table. So they are called elements. But in nature, most elements appear or exist as compound. They are elements, but they exist as compound. The most common one is water. What is water? Water is a compound of oxygen and hydrogen, H2O. So water has two elements. I just want us to get used to that. So water is a compound of two elements, hydrogen and oxygen. And they are and they are known as um what do you call it? They are known as part of you know um what uh plants need. So we also have micro elements that you can call trace element. You can move to the next slide. Yes, okay. Macro elements are needed in large quantity and they play major crucial role in plant structure, plant growth, and plant metabolism. Uh, the following are macro elements. We have nitrogen. It's essential for healthy leaves to promote overall growth. We'll still talk more about what oxygen, nitrogen does. We have phosphorus. It's crucial for root development. Now, I'll be noting these things, flowering and seed production. We have potassium, strengthening stems, and aids in water regulation. Most times you hear MPK, MPK. MPK only means the percentage of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. We have calcium. Calcium build cell walls and play roles in nutrient uptake. We have magnesium, it's essential for chlorophyll, essential for production of plant photosynthesis, also taste. We have sulfur, it plays a role in protein formation, next slide, and enzyme uh, function. Now we have micro elements. Micro elements are required in smaller quantity, but they are still very vital for various plant growth and processes. They include iron, magnesium, boron, zinc, copper, molybdenum, and chlorine. So these are what we call micro or trace elements, trace elements. Uh, in class, you have seen many of these things. You might not have taken Stand at uh, giving stand attention to it, and then so we are bringing it back to you now. This element, it's important you understand the quantity of this element that is required. That is required for healthy plant growth. Uh, let me explain something to us because I want you to understand this. Uh, subject was and for all as an adult how, how often have you uh especially if you are someone like me that's constantly working on my height so when i say my height you know what i mean actually my weight you know and then i i have to think about the calories that i take when i eat what i shouldn't eat and all that um I was talking with a nutritionist sometimes ago, and um, the lady was like, okay. So I was asking a particular question. Why are menus in certain places, especially in the night, more of protein? And she was like, okay. The reason is protein is that uh, thing that when you eat it, your body takes what it needs and discard the rest. Carbohydrate, your body stores it. What do I mean by that? 
the amount of your body weight, for example, determines the amount of certain chlorine, sorry, certain protein, uh, the volume you should take. If, if you are 100 kg, if you are 100 kg, some of us, what you need per day if you are 100 kg is probably, uh, let's say, 100 grams of protein. I'm just talking based on your body mass index. I'm not here to divide or dilute. I don't want to give you an example. That all that your body needs to live LD is 100 grams of protein. Now, you now want to eat. You now take a whole chicken. Chicken is protein, right? But a whole chicken is weighing 2.5 kg. You now sit on a meal of a old chicken and you consume it. Remember, all the protein that your body needs is just 100 grams. That means you have taken 2.4 kg or 2,400 grams, kilogram of excess protein that night. So what will your body do? Your body will take the 100 grams that it needs from that protein, uh, whatever that you have taken, digest that. The rest goes into your stomach to be excreted. Now, for carbohydrates, let's also assume your body needs 100 grams and you have eaten rice and you ate a whole bowl of rice. That is like one kg. What will your body do? Instead of your body just taking the 100 grams of the rice, it takes in the one kg or 1,000 grams and stores it as sugar and fat in your system. So that is why mostly the body can regulate protein, but it cannot regulate certain other things. So it just takes it and dumps it. And that's why you start to now see fat built up and what have you. So in this table, you have the average concentration of the elements that your plant needs based on its production stage. Plant has three major production cycles, germination, vegetation, and productive, right? Germination is when you plant the seed, it germinates, it, it starts growing, it brings out cotyledon, you have done all this, it brings out true leaves, and what of you, then you start to give nutrients, then we say move on to vegetative stage, where it's just leaves. And from vegetative stage, you now move to productive stage, where the plant now produce, excuse me, nutrient. You know, these are the three major stages. Now, based on the level, on, on, on the stage that the plant is currently, this amount of nutrient or element is what is required. And on this table, you have amount of nitrogen in nitrate form, nitrogen in ammonia form. For example, nitrogen in nitrate form, you need 70 to 300 parts per million. PPM simply means part per million. That's nitrogen in nitrate form. For nitrogen in ammonia form, you need zero you need zero point three one. Sorry, zero to thirty one, I meant part per million. Zero to thirty one part per million. Now for potassium. You need 200 to 400 parts per million. For phosphorus, you need 30 to 90 parts per million. And like that, and like that, and like that. Now, this part per million is essential for the effective or optimal growth of your plant. So now, 
Imagine when your plant needs a minimum of 70 parts per million to fer So if you are growing crop at the vegetative stage, it means you don't give the maximum. You can just give an average. So if your plant is um, you just transplanted, it means the amount of nitrogen that is part per million, in part per million is amount per 1,000 liters, okay? So should be probably like just uh, 100, 100, you know, at after transplanting. Let's say that's what you start with, 100 to 150. It means if the nitrogen in your substrate is just 50, you are not giving enough. That's the meaning. Your plant needs 200 to 400 parts per million of potassium. If what you are giving is 100 parts per million, it means you are not giving enough. Phosphorus. So when you look at this table, it's the guide. And when we give you any formula for nutrient mix, Remember, I keep saying we use switch method because many of us are not chemists. All these details are not important to you. But it's important you know how to flip the light, switch it on, switch it off. Switch it on, switch it off. So based on this table, you, start, you get certain nutrient formulation. It is based on this table, based on the amount of nutrient that the plant needs. And we look at the nutrient available. That's how we mix. If you don't have an EC meter by now, you should try and get one. Please call the sales department to get one for you. Um, if they don't have a ground, just make your booking so that when new stock comes in, you can get your PPM or EC. So PPM and EC are about the same thing. But PPM is just half EC in case you don't have the meter. So anyone you get, please understand that next, uh, next slide. Now, how do we mix? How do we mix hydroponics nutrients? We have majorly mix A and mix B. Mix A and mix B. Later in the class, I'll be saying something, but I think I just need to quickly say that so that you can understand, uh, you can understand this mix A. Why mix A? Okay, let me even know if some of us really got what we were taught in class. So I need, I want to see your comment. Why do we have mix A or solution A? And then why do we have mix B or solution B? Let me just quickly take that feedback. Let's be fast. Let's be fast, let's be fast. Who is, who is saying something? Why do we have mix A? Why do we have mix B? Um, I just quickly yourself. Uh, uh, in, I think mixing, you have Sorry, to separate... who is speaking? Your name and then just thank you. Yeah, good morning. Good morning, Webster Michael Jackson. My name is Adik Bai Musa. Um, I think uh, I don't know. Maybe just maybe I just have an idea. I'm not sure exactly what the uh, answer is. But I think uh, you have them separately because um you can't have them together in the same container because they might uh, precipitate. So you have them in different containers because there are two different uh, chemical compositions. So you can't have them together in the same container. You can only mix them in water to dissolve them in water so that they don't have that uh, chemical uh, chemical clashes. Or I don't know. I think that's why you have them separately. <laughs> it's okay. Thank you, Mr. Musa. Okay, another person. So what do you say, micro and micro? Why is that because of different growing stages? Who else? Who else? Okay, um, 
so that I, I don't waste our time. If you look at this new trend, I told you they exist as compound. There are elements that exist as compound. So because they exist as compound, they bind together. Two of them come together. Why coming together? If you don't have those that are compatible in the same stock tank, there will be issue. What is the issue? The major issue is precipitation forming. Now, precipitation should be something important to hydroponic farmer. Remember everything we are saying in hydroponics applies to soil too, because it's just about nutrients. When you have a one-year-old child and you want to give that child corn to eat, and that corn is not turned to pulp, as a grain, if the child even takes it, you will see it in the child's excrement. You will excrete it all like that because the, the body system cannot process that corn. It cannot. But when you soak the corn, you know, you, you now grind it, you malt it, or you turn it to pop, the child absorb it. The child body can use it. What am I saying? When nutrient forms precipitation, plant cannot absorb it, cannot take it, even though it's present in your growing environment. Every one of us, you know what is called rhizosphere by now. Rhizosphere is the root zone area of your plant root zone where plant is growing that environment of your substrate so if you have precipitation in the nutrient solution that means the nutrient has not dissolved you can try it at home take a cup of water take a spoon of salt pour it in that water and dissolve it mix it a time will come, you won't see the salt again. Even though the salt will start as a granule, you won't see it again. Keep adding salt. You'll get to a level of oversaturation that the salt won't dissolve. It won't mix again. That's what is called precipitation. So when you have nutrients that are not of uh, the same uh, tolerance, you get precipitation. In order to avoid precipitation, that's why we have mix A and mix B. We have those that are nitrate-based, mostly, being mixed together. And those that are phosphate and sulfate-based, they can still tolerate themselves, so being separated, and then mixed together in the stock. Get that word? In the stock. So that's why you have mix A. Mostly, it's just calcium nitrate we put in tank A. But you can also put potassium nitrate with your calcium nitrate because they both have the same binding compound, you know. Then you have your mixed B, which can be phosphate, ammonium, magnesium, sulfate, and your micro element, micro element. So the EDTA simply means that it's in a form that it's directly uh, absorbable to your plant and, it's, and it doesn't change that state. It doesn't change that state. Uh, I want us to understand the meaning of EDTA. Uh, look, look at a situation whereby you are given ice. You are given ice. So you need to take something. Okay, look at ice cream. When they give you ice cream, it is somehow, uh, is it blocked? You shall know the way your ice cream is. If you don't take it on time, what happens? It melts. And when it melts, you don't feel the taste. You don't enjoy You don't want to take it again. So EDTA means the, the nutrient, it's in a form that 
no matter the time it takes for the plant to absorb it, it doesn't lose that it state, you know? It stays like that. And over time, plant get to take it. Next slide. Next slide, we want to talk about fatigation. Many of us know what irrigation is, and you know what fatigation is. Fatigation simply means putting nutrient in your water that goes into your plant. So the difference between fatigation and irrigation is irrigation is purely water. Fatigation is water and nutrient. So fatigation is the product of applying nutrient to plants through drip irrigation. Uh, it's beyond drip irrigation. Even if you are not giving it, well, majorly drip irrigation, but if you put it, maybe you mix it in a cup and you go and put it on the plant too. You are still fatigating the plant. So here you can see we have days, like few days, say day four to five after transplanting of your plant, the crops are irrigated. That is, you only give water to stabilize the plant majorly so that you don't shock the plant. And then from about the first week, you now start to give uh, the plant nutrient. Next slide. So when you are fatigating, based on the age of the plant, there are certain nutrients that you give. Immediately you transplant uh, the plant. At the initial transplanting, you know, for their leaves to grow very fast, the stem to be well established, they need a lot of nitrogen, and then they need a lot of phosphorus. Remember, phosphorus help root formation root formation. I'm taking time to explain some of these things so that we don't have to come back to this. If a woman is pregnant and she doesn't take certain nutrients on time, like I mentioned, folic acid deficiency, it is not when she's now ready to give that. She now wants to be taking what she didn't take in her first trimester. Remember, you have first trimester in human, second trimester, third trimester. Trimester means first three months, second three months, third three months. At the first three months, certain things must be taken. Second three months, the child is now growing certain organs, you know, in the mother. Certain things must be there to help the growth, you know. Uh, the third trimester, the child is now growing certain things, he's sensitive, he's hearing, you know, that the certain things must be there. So those are the things that formed uh, this. Materials you need for fatigation, you all know all this, so let's go on. pH and EC meter. I know that. Let's go. Now, the amount of water required by plants can be influenced by different parameters. Plant age, temperature, relative humidity. Well, rainfall, if it is in the open. But remember, plant does not need rain. It only needs water. Uh, on a daily basis, plant needs from like... Uh, 0 0.5 liters to sometimes 2.5, 3 liters of water a day. Depend on all this, the plant age, the temperature of the environment, the relative humidity. Relative humidity is the amount of water in the atmosphere. Amount of water in the atmosphere. Next slide. Now, what is... So, we... I'm sure we have now understood... The basis of nutrient. You know this before, but I've repeated it to you. So the art of plant diagnosis, where to look for clues. Plants are excellent communicators. They speak, but they speak a silent language. If there's something called a dog whistle, if you blow a dog whistle, Human being will not feel anything. But dogs will be coming from different areas and you'll be shocked. I don't know if this is a general rule. I remember when I was growing up and I tried to whistle. My parents would say, stop it. You don't whistle in the night. 
And I said, why? He said, because you will be calling attractive snake. I don't know if it's a general rule anywhere. It means there is a certain decibel, there's a certain sound you are putting out there, you know, that certain animal hears. And they come because they can communicate with you. If you have seen a, 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 a full animal heading cow, there are certain words, there are certain signs it gives to the cow, and the cow knows what exactly what the full animal is saying. So we communicate with any living being. You just need to understand that living thing. Plants also communicate, even though their language is silent. But you need your visual, you know, sense to hear the language of plant. So learning to read the visual signs they present is key to identifying nutrient deficiency. And here are the things you need to pay attention to. Number next slide. Let's start with new growth versus old growth. Right, farmer, what is a new growth? As plant grows, it brings out new shoots. We have something called growing tip. You should understand growing tip by now. That's the part of the plant that comes out first with leaves and it gets to elongate, you know, based on oxygen activity. It elongates, it turns to stem, grows, leaves, stem, grows, leaves, stem, turns to flower, and all that. Some deficiencies target new leaves first. Why others impact older leaves first? This can happen because certain nutrients are mobile within the plant and can be redistributed from older leaves to newer growth area. Next slide. Now, we have color changes, color changes. A vibrant green is a sign of good health. When you see a human being, you will know somebody that is feeding well just by the look, you know? So when your plant has vibrant green, now, how do I define vibrant green? I don't know, but you should know. It's, you see it when you sell the plant. Everywhere green. You, you, you get what I'm saying? So, discoloration, like yellowing. Yellowing can also be called chlorosis. Browning, spotting, or poppling on the leaf can indicate specific nutrient deficiencies so you need to pay attention to the color very very important so we are going into visual guides to certain common deficiencies uh let's put our detective skill to work here is a closer look at some of the common nutrient deficiencies and their responsive signal now let's look at calcium 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 deficiency. Every time you see a dead spot on new leaves, dead spot on new leaves, stunted growth or deformed growth. You get to see this a lot if you do bell pepper. You just see them stunted. I'm sure some of you are observing. You, you can picture what I'm saying now. You see it in your tomato sometimes. They will just look somehow. So, or you see spots on the leaves. If it is fruit, at the base of the fruit, you see that brown spot. You see it on that tomato, you see it on that pepper, you know, like it's rotting on that. On the leaves is a spot. That's calcium deficiency. In lettuce or crops that you harvest, for example, lettuce only grows within three weeks. It's ready for harvest. You see calcium deficiency on the tip of the leaf. The tip of the lettuce leaf we look burnt. 
any vegetable that you harvest early, you see the leaf. The reason is calcium is essential for cell wall development and the structure of the cell wall. So when you don't have enough, the leaf becomes weak. You, you get what I'm saying? In, in, in leafy, because cal the, the plant grows faster than how calcium moves. So you get to see that. The second thing is, calcium is like, calcium is like the giant. You want to cross a bridge. You want to cross. Okay, you are your plant growth is like crossing a water or a river. You are crossing a river. There is only one giant that is tall enough that can cross that river and the river will not go beyond its waist. You know when water is beyond your waist, they say you should be careful. It can That water can sweep you over and you get drowned. Any water above your waist level. So a tall man has enough height and built to walk across a flowing river that is not to waste the level. So other people are short. So every time they need this tall man to back them, to take them across the river. Calcium often acts as that tall man. It backs other nutrients and takes them across the plant growth process into the plant's cell. It means when calcium is deficient, the it's not only calcium deficiency that will be showing on your plant. Please, this is very important. If that tall man is not available at the river bank when people need to cross, Yes, it stretches bone in human. Yes, sir. Where people need to cross. It means at the other side of the river, you will not have the tall man and you will not have all the people the tall man is meant to back. So if there are five people tall man is supposed to back and carry across the water, on the other side of the water, you'll be seeing almost six deficiencies. And the reason for that is the tall man is not available. Because as I'll be mentioning some of these deficiencies, you will still be hearing about some that affect cell wall structure and all that. So many of them, if calcium is deficient, automatically it leads to deficiency of so many other nutrients. Next slide now. I, I want you to have that uh, understanding and see how important calcium is. Now look at nitrogen. Nitrogen deficiency, its symptom is dead spot on new leaves. Dead spot on new leaves. Dead spot on new leaves. Every time you see a dead spot on new leaves, you should know there is calcium deficiency. Dead spot on new leaves. Also, when you see stunted growth or deformed growth, but what will help you to guess don't let me say guess. Help you to know that it is calcium is where the spot is being observed. New leaves. New leaves. New leaves. Sorry. Um, I was using calcium to say nitrogen. Nitrogen is overall yellowing of leaves. And it starts from older leaves. Sorry, 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 sorry. I was mixing up myself. It starts from older leaves and it progresses upward. It starts from older leaves and it progresses upward. It also shows in stunted growth. It also shows in stunted growth. Now, stunted growth, why? Because calcium also helps nitrogen to flow. I want you to understand that calcium helps nitrogen to move. So when you see stunted growth, suspect it. So 
it's not just nitrogen. It's possible it's calcium. What do you need to do? You look at the nutrients you are giving. For example, in hydroponics, we mostly have calcium nitrate. So calcium is there with the nitrate, though not in enough quantity. We'll talk about that later. Nitrogen is vital for chlorophyll production. So a deficiency of nitrogen leads to that yellowing. Chlorophyll is the color, the green thing you see in plant. Uh, if you look at that picture there, you can see that the yellowing is in the older leaves. So that's nitrogen deficiency. It's, it's very clear. What about potassium? The symptoms, how do you know it's potassium deficiency you are seeing? Potassium shows as burnt leaf edges with brown spots and weak stem. Now, sometimes you can confuse potassium with calcium deficiency because if you are growing lettuce, the way calcium deficiency will show in your lettuce is how it will show in uh, other plants. But what helps you to know, okay, this is calcium deficiency, is the crop. Now, for other plants, plants that easily show potassium deficiency is a plant like cucumber. You will just see that the leaves look as if it's burning. If you touch it, it's brittle. It can break. You, you see that crisp, crispness. You know, plant leaf is meant to look robust. It can bend, you know. The moment you see that brown spot, burnt edges or brown spot, you can break it. Then weak stem. Weak stem. Weak stem when you are giving plant water. There's something called tugor pressure. You can read about tugor later. Tugor, T U. GGR, sugar pressure. Sugar pressure is, is the water pressure that keeps plant upright. In that plant stem you are looking at, what keeps it upright and okay is water. So it's called sugar. When plant loses sugar, the stem can become weak. It looks as if it's wilting. But when it is potassium deficiency, you will observe it that it's not that the plant lacks water. That the stem is just weak. It, it cannot stand upright. Suspect, uh, sorry, suspect potassium. Then you look at the leaves, you are seeing that burnt edges. Some other things cause, a lot of things cause burnt edges, which I will get to. But that brittleness in the leaf, you can break it. You, you know it is potassium because it plays a major role in water regulation and then in maintaining cell integrity. So the deficiency leads to weak and brittle plant. You can, you can see uh, that image there. See the tip of the leaf. Now this is tomato. Tomato takes a long time. Tomato is not a fast crop. So easily you don't suspect calcium here. When you see something like this, you can suspect something else, but when we get there, we'll let you know that. So you just look at that. You can see that the leaf's tip looks at the part of the leaf itself. When you touch it, it will, it will just, it can turn into powder. You know, it easily shows calcium deficiency. Next. You can, you, you can see that in pepper wilting and um, all that. Now, what about phosphorus? Phosphorus. Phosphorus, the 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 size. Uh, phosphorus majorly starts, or you observe uh, that your plant is having phosphorus deficiency from the root. I'm not saying that in my. Uh, you know why. Because the root is the first, is the place where plant takes nutrient. If the plant root is not developed as it should, then the plant cannot take enough food. It cannot take enough food. So the symptoms you see 
is where plant cannot take enough food, it means the plant will naturally be small. So your total plant size and the plant leaf are reduced. Your leaves are chlorotic or they look, they, are, they wilt, especially older leaves. You just look, this plant is not meant to be, they are meant to be more robust. They are meant to be bigger than what I'm saying. You, you get what I'm saying? Easily you suspect phosphorus because phosphorus affects the root of the plant. So when the root of the plant is not well developed, it means the plant itself will not be well developed. So you see that smallness, it's not really stunted. There's a difference between stunting and not growing too well. When it is stunted, it won't grow. If, if you have started growing your crop by now, you will know that stage that the plant, no matter what you give, is just not, it's just small like that. And you have a very good seed. But they are just, and they, they are just small. But in phosphorus deficiency, they are growing, but they are not growing as big or as fast as they should. Because the root environment is not big enough. One thing you can do is to sacrifice one plant. Just uproot it. Just uproot it. Easily you will see when the root formation is meant to be robust and big, it will just be small. Then you can easily suspect, oh, there is phosphorus deficiency here. Let's be fast. Let's move to the next deficiency. Yeah, let, let's just talk about that color also. Uh, move back, move back. You can see that purplish. That purplish color. Though it, it, sometimes it's confusing because it also shows a magnesium deficiency. But majorly it's in that size of the leaf that you observe or, or the plant that you observe phosphorus deficiency. Next one is magnesium. The symptom magnesium deficiency also shows yellowing. But there's a difference between the yellowing in magnesium and yellowing in nitrogen. Yellowing between the vein of older leaves and it progresses inward. So you can look at that picture. Uh, I'm sure you are familiar with it. If you have been going, you'll see that the vein, you know what the vein is? It's that thin, that line, that line. When you see yellowing in that vein, when you see yellowing in that vein, then suspect deficiency magnesium. Magnesium is also important for chlorophyll formation or chlorophyll production. So deficiency impact photosynthesis and that leads to the yellowing that you see. In the vein, it starts and it progresses inward. Move to the next one. Manganese, close to magnesium. Also remember magnesium is what makes your plants taste to be very sweet. When you, it needs to be sweet, so if it's also not there, when the plant is fruiting, you will, you will feel it in the taste. But at the growing stage, look at the yellowing in the vein, it tells you. So symptoms of manganese. Manganese shows, manganese shows in intervenial area of young leaves. The young leaves becomes chlorotic. It, it shrinks. It shrinks. And then the vein still remains dark green. Now, if you look at the grain in magnesium, the vein of the plant turns to yellow in magnesium. But in manganese, it's the internal area of the plant itself that is turning yellow, that is becoming chlorotic. Because manganese deficiency also shows deficiency in iron and in the uh, especially in younger leaves um, when you magnesium shows in much older leaves so the difference is one shows in the vein the other shows in the inner 
uh, what do you call it? Layer of belief. Let's move to the next one. The next one is called molybdium. In molybdium, the symptoms affect the plant. Uh, the plant doesn't show any discoloration, but the plant loses shape, especially in its young leaves. You, you observe this deficiency in peppers, in tomatoes, the, the plant look uh, crooked. It looks crooked. When you see that crookedness, crookedness in your plant leaf, remember we are discussing visual, you know, ways of observing this. You suspect molybdenum. What about iron? Iron deficiency also shows yellowing, but yellowing of new leaves, the vein will remain green. New leaves, the vein will remain green. It will remain green. Uh, iron is also essential for chlorophyll production and all that. Um, next is zinc. Zinc in pepper. The plant size is stunted because of shorting internodes and smaller leaves than normal. What are internodes? Internodes is where plant brings fruit. You have fruit node. You know, you have stem, you have the leaves, and where the fruit comes from. It moves to another one, fruit. So when you have very short internode, when they are too close to each other, your fruiting will be affected. So when you observe the way your plant is growing, the internodes are short, then suspect that you are having zinc deficiency. Though most of all these uh, trace or micro elements, the moment you have um, their concentration in your nutrients, you mostly don't get to see some of these, but when you observe some of the things we are saying, you should know that you have zinc deficiency. We cannot exhaust the list, but these are just basic um, observation that you can make by just looking, you know, at the plant. So, uh, what else causes deficiency in nutrients? Nutrient deficiencies are primary cause of poor health in hydroponics, but they are not the whole story. So, what are the other things that causes um, deficiency in nutrient? So, the first one I'll talk about is pH imbalance. The, the pH level of your nutrient solution significantly impacts nutrient availability. Even if the correct nutrients are present, if the pH is not at the level it should be, either it's too high or it's too low, certain nutrients will be locked out. That is, they will not be accessible to the plant. Now, most variety of vegetable grow at a pH that is slightly acidic. Many of us should know that by now. Slightly acidic pH, minimum 5.5 .5 and to about 6.8, there about. So when the light is low, you have an uh, overcast day or you grow in the environment, you may not really understand that in a temperate environment like Nigeria. Plants take up more potassium and phosphorus from the nutrient solution. So when they do that, acidity increases. So even if your pH uh, is right, uh, I think people in Portacourt may, when you have soot, or um, especially now in the rainy season, you have cloudy sky a lot. So your plant takes a lot more you know, um, of phosphorus and potassium, and it can lead to acidity in your nutrients. So it, it means even if your pH is right at the beginning, you must be checking the pH regularly to make sure it still remains at the normal level. Now, when you have strong light, that is, everything is clear, plants take up more nitrogen from the nutrient solution. So acidity increases. So pH is very, very 
important. I want you to note that. Now, how does pH cause nutrient lockout? I think we still have it later, but majorly at the wrong pH, the composition of your nutrient changes. Nutrients that were initially soluble can become insoluble. And the moment nutrients is insoluble, remember, plant cannot take it. That is a nutrient that has dissolved, that has dissolved fully, can sometimes form its precipitation back. Put, get a glass of water, put a spoon of salt in it, mix it, mix it, mix it very well. At the time, the salt disappears. That is, it blends or mixes with the water. Pour that water in the pot, put it on fire. When evaporation starts, the water will disappear, the salt will be left. That's precipitation. That means change in temperature can lead to precipitation, okay? You get what I'm saying? So even though, so change in pH can, can turn nutrient that had been soluble to become insoluble. You, you get what I'm saying? So that can lead to nutrient lockout. And when nutrient is locked out, it can lead to deficiency. Oh, my plants initially are looking good, but whether it's affecting and you are not checking and your pH has changed, you know, so nutrient can get locked out and you don't know. The next thing, over fertilization. That's another thing that leads to deficiency. That is, uh, too much of a good thing really can also be bad. Over fertilization can lead to nutrient burn. To the, uh, and the symptoms will be when I said the tip burn earlier. Uh, it's not just calcium deficiency, it's not just potassium deficiency. So, over fertilization also leads to uh, that tip burn. You will, you will see it. I remember in the early days when we started hydroponics and we were. We didn't know the right way to mix nutrients. We were sham mixing and our plants are growing. And we just discovered that the tip of the plant is burnt. You know, uh, I remember that time until my coach said, no, 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 no. What, what quantity of this do you have? What point? And when he said, no, you are you overfeeding the plant. You're killing the plant, you know. So over fertilization will now lead to stunted growth because you have too much salt built up. And um, all, what, do you, what do you need to do? Just dilute it when we get into that. Also, environmental factor. How does environmental factor lead to nutrient deficiency? Uh, hydroponic does not isolate plants from all stress. Suboptimal temperature, insufficient light, or poor oxygenation of the root can create symptoms that mimic nutrient deficiency. Uh, so uh, what do I mean? Remember we said if you don't have substrate that is porous, that means oxygen cannot go in. If oxygen cannot grow in, the root of the plant cannot take nutrient. So even though you are putting nutrient in the substrate, plant is not eating it because there is no porosity. The environment is not uh, conducive. You know, if you don't have enough light, photosynthesis is low, your plant is not taking enough uh, nitrogen, you know, so it's not growing well. You still see um, nutrient deficiency. Sometimes uh, you, you use shading because you have too much sunlight. But it, it comes to a time that the, the shading is basically too much. So your plant also shows deficiency. If you are a poultry farmer and um, you, you raise laying board, the system or the journey of laying board, for the board to be laying, boards are meant to lay every 26 hours, between 24 and 26 hours, they should lay one egg. But for them to maintain that laying cycle consistently, they must have 18 hours light a day. 18 hours light. So you see poultry farms without light. When it is 7 p.m., 
everywhere is dark, especially in tropical area. In temperate region, in summer, 10 p.m., you still have sunlight. It's still bright. So they don't need it mostly, but you see all the pen are equipped with light. Because in temperate region, in winter, sometimes by 4, 5 p.m., it's dark already. So what do they do? They, they put on the light to make sure it stays till 10 p.m. Now, it doesn't mean you should increase their feeding. It only means their pituitary gland must sense that light to form egg production. The same thing with plants. Plants need minimum amount of light. The plants you have, you, you want adequate... Uh, normally, if you want plants to grow very well, they should have like 14 hours of light. We hardly get that. Even in in the tropics, light starts from around six. The sun is out. You may not really see the plant leaves start sensing it until like 6 p.m., 7 p.m. But remember that during the day, sometimes from 12 p.m., but mostly from 1 to like 3.34, when the sun is too much, plant doesn't grow with too much light. They go into a fix. They stay. So they don't use that light. So that amount of hours is also deducted from the amount of light that is available to your plant. So some of these things contribute to uh, deficiency in plants. Those are some of the environmental factors. So that's when you must know when you don't have enough light, you need to, or you have too much light. So uh, though like that one to three, if you have shading in your greenhouse, you activate it. It cools down uh, the environment, reduces the amount of light. So your plant gets to grow and all that. Next uh, chapter. How do you treat or how do you prevent uh, this deficiency of how do you make your plant, your greenhouse, your garden, your everything to grow well? Now that you can detect this deficiency uh, in, an in an hydroponics environment, how do you identify the problem? How do you make them grow well? Consider factors like pH. And um, if pH is wrong, you know what to do. So. By now, one of us should know how to control pH. When pH is acidic, you need to make it, you need to raise it. How do you raise it? You add something like, uh, um, what do we call it now? That is cheap. Bicarbonate. And easily available. Bicarbonate, sodium bicarbonate is very available and affordable. Just get it. Uh, so people call it soda ash, whatever. Mix it. You know how to, if you want to bring up, let me just assume 1,000 liter of water. Don't just go and pour it in the 1,000 liter. Take 10 liter out of it. You can start with, okay, let me add one gram or two grams of bicarbonate to 10 liters and check. When you, whatever quantity you add to 10 liters, you now multiply it to give you the quantity you need to add to change the pH of a thousand or 10,000 liter, whatever, whatever you. If you want to reduce pH, oh, your pH is showing eight, which is too much. It's too uh, alkaline for your plant. You want to reduce it to like six or 6.5. What do you need to do? You add an acid, uh, nitric acid, phosphoric acid, sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid is, Think about the cheapest. That's your normal battery water. Uh, when you add all these things, it doesn't impact the chemistry of your water, so it does not affect your nutrient. It only affects the uh, the pH. So, identify the problem. What is causing it? Is it pH? If it is pH, correct your pH. And if it is nutrient, adjust the nutrient. If the if the cause is a nutrient deficiency, targeted supplement or complete switch to your fertilizer may be needed. Always follow the dilution recommendation. So also when you have too much of nutrient, that's why 
mostly you also need an EC meter. Uh, depending on the plant stage, when you just transplant your plants, when they are at just the initial vegetative stage, 0 0.7 or 1 EC, electrical conductivity, it's okay for the plant, but you need an EC meter to measure that. You understand? So if it's too low, they won't grow. You know nutrient is low. If it's too high, it causes burning and all that. So when it is too, when, let's assume your EC is showing 2.5, when it should be 1.5, what do you need to do? Just dilute, just add ordinary water gradually. The same way I explain pH, you have 1,000 liter, take 10 liter out, be diluting it. So what kind of water did I use to dilute this EC from this level to this level and then apply accordingly? Next, so address the pH. We have said that flushing. Flushing is, uh, let's assume you discover it is either pH or too much of nutrient in your growing environment. How do you know in your growing environment? From time to time, dip your hand in your substrate around the root zone. Take When you just finish fatigation, take out the substrate, squeeze it into a cup or a bowl. Then use your pH meter, your EC meter to check for the parameters. If you have too much concentration, then flush. Flush. Just flush. What is flush? Add water. It dilutes it. Very easy. So maintain optimal environment. Keep temperature, light, water oxygenation, everything. Keep it at range. There's something that I think I didn't mention that we all, I'll quickly need to mention here that affects uh, plant growth. It is carbon dioxide. And uh, if, if the optimal carbon dioxide mostly is 330 parts per million, that's the ambient carbon dioxide. So if you have more, if you have up to 1,000 parts per million carbon dioxide, plant grows more. So if you have an environment, you have maybe several greenhouses and you are growing an enclosure, I will encourage that uh, you may find a way to introduce carbon dioxide CO2 once in a while. An easy way to do that, you can just burn some things around, but be careful not to burn your greenhouse so that you don't say I'm the one that said. So, uh, you know, from carbon monoxide, the plant can take carbon dioxide as you burn something around smoke. It helps to increase the carbon dioxide uh, quantity in the environment, which can also help plant grow very well. So regular pH check and all that. Next slide. In conclusion, nutrient deficiency might seem intimidating at first, but as an hydroponic farmer, from what you have seen, you've learned that for you to have a very good harvest, you need to understand and see. So when you understand the principle of plant nutrition, when you are a keen observer, when you can look very well, and then you quickly take corrective measure, you, you can have uh, a flourishing and um, LD, you know, production in your hydroponic or soil farm. Now, everything I've said about hydroponics, remember it's the same thing for soil environment because soil naturally should have certain nutrients. So if you see this deficiency, around your soil, you should know that you need to add or supplement with nutrients. Let me quickly say something about micro elements that many people don't also focus on. The yield, there's something called law of minimum. I want every one of us to go and study it after this class. Maybe we will find the time to also take it as a whole course. The law of minimum, Google it. Basically, what he tried to say is what, what affects yield? Mostly, it's not deficiency of macro elements. 
like for a country like Nigeria, you observe every year government give urea or MPK as um as uh, as a supplement. Sorry, or when they say ah, we are giving farmers fertilizer, they give urea or they give MPK, which are the macro elements. Our yield is very low. Now, the micro element that is deficient in our soil is now that thing they don't mostly give. One of our farmers have been on my head when we had uh, micro element scarcity in Nigeria. Uh, Chile mix, it became very scarce because of some of the policies of the government. They are not being brought into the country and then anytime you now have it, they now dilute it. We we used to buy from a particular company, and um, you know, a particular quantity, two fifty grams is what they said they packed. That is there until a customer complained, and the staff did not even verify. We now checked and discovered that what was even called two fifty grams. Is 200, some 180. We got furious, angry with the man, and he said, well, that's how I import it. I said, you didn't verify anyway, because we also didn't verify, we just kept quiet. But the thing now became very scarce, and it's affecting plants. So we have to buy it like that. So what am I saying? Just understand the source of your deficiency. And good enough, most of the micro element, the trace element, plant only needs them in very minute quantity, very little, in a whole 1,000 liter of water. Sometimes you don't even need more than 20 grams. And if you check your parameter where well, you may not even add it all the time, because once it's there, it stays in the plant, it stays in the substrate, and then it, it helps the growth. Certain other nutrient, certain other nutrient is, um, uh, you know, also have traces of micro elements and what have you. So um, we will stop here. Let me take some few questions and then we move into the next thing. So this is the order of question. Please raise your hand. You know how to uh, use the hand icon. Just click it, raise your hand. Then they get to you, you unmute, ask your question, and then you mute yourself. Thank you. Or you can just put the question in the chat box. Thank you very much. Let's do that and then we can call it a date. Yeah, so that we can go about um, our activity for today. Questions. Okay, can we have a link to self-listen to this later? Yes, it's recorded. The it's recorded. It 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 will be shared. Um, let me say I want it shared because those who didn't attend, what should we do to them? Uh, uh, how many? I I what do we what do we do? Okay, it will be shared. Please. Take everyone that attended, we get um how do I put it? We get this. Everyone that attended. Um just send the message. Everyone that attended this meeting now, send the message to the uh please put the number there so that they will send it to your email. Just send just send your email now to uh, Femi. Put the official line, yours and the, uh, the training official line. Just let me quickly put it up so that just send your email to the lines. They will, they will share it with you. And then if, if you want to Send it to the line, please. 
send the email to the line. Can you type the line there? Can yes, you send, send it to the line so that don't send the email here, just send it to that line. Otherwise, subscribe to our YouTube and um, have access to this. Aroda, thank you very much for this training. I appreciate it. My question is, can a plan with nutrient everything still still be corrected or should it be discarded? It depends on the stage of the deficiency. When your plan should have enough phosphorus, please don't send, don't send email to this chat. Don't send email to this chat. Send it to the number. By now, I expect that Femi has typed the numbers. Send it to the number displayed. Send it to the number displayed. Send it to the number displayed. Don't send it to the chat. It will not, we won't see it. They said some don't have Zoom. No, 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 it won't be on Zoom. Just send, just send your email to that number displayed. They will send you a YouTube link. They will send you a YouTube link to this training. It will be uploaded on YouTube. It will send you a YouTube link. So it depends on the stage of the deficiency. Certain deficiency can be corrected. Certain ones cannot really be corrected. Let me give you an example. If you are observing calcium deficiency in lettuce, you won't see it until the lettuce are fully grown. Then you see the tip bone. When you observe that, one other way to quickly correct that is to aerate the environment. Yes, I didn't add that to deficiency, uh, deficiency uh, this thing. So just aerate, blow more hair, clear the environment, let there be more movement, you know, and it can, can still correct it if it's not too late. You have phosphorus deficiency. If your plants are not fruiting yet, you can correct it. But the moment your plants are already fruiting, it will be difficult. I mean, very difficult to correct. Yes, everyone that has attended, either you attend daily or late, they will send you the YouTube link. Don't worry. They will send you the YouTube link. So you will have it. There is no problem. Uh, who is iPad? They will send you the YouTube link once you have you have attended. Yes, they will send you the YouTube link because it will be uploaded on that. Or let me say, um, if we can upload it on our dedicated Facebook page too, I will, I will try and see so that you can access it there. Okay, any other question? Go ahead, sir, Mr. Soji. Go ahead. Yeah, hello, Mr. Lebo. Good afternoon. Or oh, is it morning? Let me not use the dressing to no, judge. No, or, <laughs> it's morning to me. Yeah, it's, it's just after six. Good morning. Thank you so much for the this impactful training. Um, my question goes to us, so I don't waste people's time here. Um, you know, some of us would say we have like um of fish pond very nearby our greenhouse. And we just think or we can just take that, scoop out the water and start sprinkling on our plant. Yeah. So here comes where my question would, you know, I, I just don't believe we can just scoop out the water and start, you know, wet as in pouring it on our plants or whatever, because we need to also understand where the EC actually stands. So we're not like over um, let, let me say over fertilizing because we don't know the nutrient content of that um, fish pond water. So is it advisable to just use it like that or we also need to always test it to know what the nutrient content is so we don't just burn out all of our plants. The same way we also consider that of chicken um, foods that we don't just you know spread it immediately on you need to dry it before you can apply it to your maybe your substrate or everything any other thing so can you share more light on that aspect of fish pond um, water thank you sir. so thank you for for thank you mr soji for fish pond water is actually a waste of time the water you have your fish in the major buildup in that water is ammonia 
and your plant only need very minute quantity of ammonia. That's why in aquaponics, you break down ammonia using nitrosomonas and nitrobacter. You break it to nitrite, which plants don't also need in large quantity, and then break it to nitrate, which is the nitrogen that your plant majorly need. So when your fish is inside water, there is no nitrate in that water. Fish too doesn't survive with nitrate in the water. The, you need to have broken down uh, or nitrified the water with active fish before that water is useful to your plant. So when you just take that water and you give it to plant, majorly what you are bombarding your plant with is a lot of ammonia. And the, the, the way plants use ammonia is not the quantity you are giving it. So it doesn't work that way. It must first be broken down. It must first be broken down before that water can be useful to the plant. So that's, that, that's the way it works. So maybe one thing you can do is if you have a reservoir, you can push the water into the reservoir, then convert the ammonia to nitrate. One way to to do that, nitrate doesn't affect your fish, but it helps your plant. Is we mentioned using of uh, uh, what do we call it? Um, microorganisms. You can just pour the microorganism in the water to break down the ammonia. So when it's now in nitrate form, you can now pour it um, into your. How do you know what you have in the water? You can. There are measuring devices that measures specific nutrients. They are not really common, but you you can have them. Um, if Femi is in the farm, you can go into my office in the drawer. There should be a nitrogen and some other measuring apparatus there. You can bring it out and show. So you, you take some of the water, you add some liquid, it has a chart that now shows you, okay, this is what you have in the water. If it's ammonia, it will show you on the chart. If it's nitrogen, it will show you on the chart. If it's a lot of phosphorus, it will show you on the chart. You may need to have that so that it will help you to know what you are actually giving to your plant. In terms of chicken pool, the major problem is lignin. You, you need to break down lignin first. It takes time to do that. That's why when it is dry, it's faster. And then when it is composted, it's even better. So the process of composting actually helps in breaking down lignin because without that, the nutrient will not be available to the plant. It will still be killing your plant. Thank you. Somebody hand this up. I hope I answered your question, Mr. Saji. Welcome, sir. Somebody has his up. Who is that? Can you, you can unmute, ask your question, and then lower the hand. Good afternoon, sir. My Good name is uh, Obina Charles from Uyo. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for this. Please, I have a question regarding the, the pH. If my source of uh, water uh, the bowl I'm using is constantly giving me maybe four to five pH. Does it mean that each time I refill the tank, I must step up the pH? Yes, sir. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, something you can do, we do it in fish farming. Have a tank. Have a buffer tank. If you are using that bowl for your farm. Have a buffer tank. So when you pump from the bowl, it goes to a reservoir. Before it goes into your nutrient tank, let it go through a buffer. A cheap buffer for pH is oyster shell. Get oyster shell. Go to feed mills. Buy oyster shell. Uh, you know this 200 liter tank, this blue tank? Yes. Buy the quantity that can fill it. Let's assume it is about three bags. The first bag, crush it. Not Don't crush it into full powder. Yeah. Then 
Push them at different granules. Okay. Do you understand? Crush them at different granules. So the how do I put it? The one you have not crushed at all, pour it on in the tank at the base. Okay. At the base. Are you following me? Yes, pour I'm it to the, right at the there. base. Then as you crush it. Be laying in it like that. Why the most crushed okay. is at the top. Now, air is the difficult part that you need to understand. It's called sedimentation process or filtration process. When water is coming from your nutrient tank, you don't, it doesn't go into that tank from the top. Okay. It goes from the bottom. Okay. I want you to picture what I just said. Yes. From your reservoir. Your reservoir is big. Just put a pipe and let it go into that blue tank. But it enters under it. Under it. Yes, put a valve, connect it. So as the water comes in, it starts from the lower part the and part. rises through the oyster shell. So the tank is not fully covered with oyster shell. As it gets to the top, Put a pipe and the water flows into your Those, tank so it can be directly into your nutrient tank or into okay. a tank that you pump into your nutrient tank. So when you do that, you are buffering it. It's a very fast and cheap buffer because that, that shell can last like that for like six months to one year. You may be changing it okay. every six months or one year. Yeah. So that you don't have... It's the same thing for hydroponics. So that's if you know you have acidic water. That's the cheap way because oyster shell increases alkalinity. But you, you now need to now check how alkaline the water you are getting mm -hmm. is. Uh -huh. yes. So dilution will not solve the problem. Okay. Okay. Okay, okay. sir. Thank you yeah. so much, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, who else? I, who, I'll see another hand up. If you have attended to you, please lower the hand. If Hello, sir. Person, oh, yeah, go ahead, sir. Hello, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Your name, where you're calling from, and your question. Um, my name is Andrew John Pampam, -Pam, calling from Abuja here. How's that, John? I don't know. <laughs> I greet you, my boss. Well then. Yeah. Um, I'm really happy to be part of this training. Um. May God bless you, sir, for you, we that are old stock, we are learning from new innovation from your expertise, sir. Thank you. Um, so I want you to help us because there are some of us that uh, are looking at the cost of nutrients this time around and what we can do to cut cost in, in respect of nutrients. Now, I, um, I would like you to rephrase or teach us to tell to tell us all here now in 200 um, let's say um, 2000 liter tank what quantity of um, nutrients should we miss in 2000 tank then if is it okay again if we are going to do in 100 liter tank also which you can feed directly by hand feeding so um, what quantity is um, okay for 100 liter tank? Why I'm saying this is that the quantity you are going to use for 2,000 or 1,000 liter tank of nutrients, it's a little bit high. But when you come to 100 liter tank, the quantity is a little bit low, but you are doing direct feeding. So please, can you, I don't know, maybe if you are getting my, the idea of what I'm trying to, um, I'm asking, I'm, I'm begging you to teach us here. So which, what do we do? <laughs> what do oh, we do? <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, oh, God, John. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm, I'm supposed to charge Ogadjo oh, separately. We never <laughs> chop government. I'm sorry, never, sir. We never chop government money now. <laughs> we will chop, <jump>, sir. <laughs> <laughs> please uh, anyway it's, it's okay it's okay um let's let's just have certain principle in our head um there is no okay for everyone 
Just, just take it this way. For every 1,000 liter, you need about one kg of nutrients or one liter of nutrients, ideally. Now, remember, nutrient comes in two forms, A and B. That's why it's they tell it's sometimes okay, 500 grams of this, 500 grams of that. But in principle, in principle, for every one kg of hydroponics mix B, you have 80%, 80 to 100 percent of hydroponics mix A. Let me repeat myself. For every one kg of hydroponics mix B. This is in principle. You have 80 to 100% of that of hydroponic mix A. That means at that grade, it's compatible, it can work. So if you have, let's assume you have 400 grams of uh, ammonium phosphate, 400 grams of maybe potassium mixed with nitrate and something, uh, or 350, you have 100 grams of uh, magnesium sulfate, um, 20 grams of chili to mix and all that. You can have 800 grams or 700 grams of calcium nitrate solely in your tank A, and it will work. So divide that downward. What happens is, when you have nutrient mix in 2,000 liters, when you have your nutrient mix in a 2,000 liter tank and you feed it to your plant, because you don't really monitor your fatigation process. If you are feeding at a time, your plant is not eating. You are just wasting your nutrient. When, when plant is, is, is on is when the plant will take nutrient. All we do is to make sure there is nutrient in the substrate when the plant needs it. You you have a child and you don't you left the child at home and they, okay look look at children breastfeeding children when they want to oh, breastfeed they start they start crying and the um, parent goes. Uh, sorry, parent gives the child breast and the child takes the milk and they stop crying. Parents that are working expresses their breast milk in bottle and store it. I was even watching a documentary of a woman that, that expresses her breast milk certain quantity every day, freeze it and donate it to orphanages and places where children that were abandoned are. So when the child cries, all you need to do is take the nutrient, feed the child, he eats and have it. So the principle is there must be nutrient available when the child needs food. Otherwise, if nutrient is not available, when the child is hungry, he won't be able to eat. But when you just say, you pour down the milk, it's not stored, it's wasted. So in large quantity, if you don't time your fatigation well, if you don't follow the process well, you are wasting almost half of your nutrients because you give it when plant does not need it. And it's wasted. That's what happened. That is why mostly when you mix in your 100 or 200 liter tank, you manage it more, you can give it more and all that. And remember, the, the mix ratio is to get adequate results from your plant. When you give four days of nutrient, you give a whole day of water. Four days of nutrient, a whole day of water. If you are fatigating, every morning, first give, first irrigate, first flush your drip with water. Then give nutrient. End it with water. So that helps to maintain your drip also. You get what I'm saying? So when you follow these processes, you discover that you don't actually waste uh, your nutrients and you conserve it. Okay, John? Yes, sir. Clear? Yes, sir. Very crystal clear, sir. Um, okay. 
And when you, there is, you made a statement that when the plant needs, but in hydroponics, we are consistently supposed to um, feed in nutrients. When you are using substrate, does that mean that how do we know when our plant needs this nutrient? We are not wasting nutrient when it does not need it, sir. So what, what, what happened is this. Um, uh, you need to, to know how to... Okay, let me put it this way. Remember, in order to save cost, we build basic hydroponic system. Normally, advanced hydroponic systems should have sensors that read parameters. Yes, sir and applies it per time. So this work that you need computer to do, you use your brain to now do it. Your plant needs, you have the basic plant need as we have stated in the nutrient. So you can say, okay, um, at this particular plant growth stage, you are giving each plant probably about one liter of water a day. If you have 1000 plants, you should know you are using about 1000 liters of water a day. We have 500 yes. plants, you know, you're using 500 liters of water a day. So you, you, you stagger that based on how much water drips from your um, drip, which you can check. So you stagger that. You may just be opening water for the 15 minutes or 10 minutes per time. And you do that six times a day. So you can say, okay, 8 a.m., uh, 9 a.m., 10, 11, 12, you stop. You continue again, maybe by four. You get what I'm saying? At the yes. peak of the heat, don't bother to give because they won't take it. You are just wasting it. They will be perspiring. What you can do when you have heat now, it's if you have a misting machine, you can use a very powerful spray card, but if you have the one that can give mist, just mist your greenhouse. Just put what kind of a mist to your greenhouse so that they can it it brings down and cools down uh what do you call it the heat in the environment especially now that there is heat surge just mist the environment then when the temperature cools down give nutrient again because when you also give nutrient when you have too much light it affects the they don't take it you are wasting your nutrient mm -hmm. so wow these are things you now need to do with your brain otherwise you are just wasting your nutrient Wow. So seriously, this is it for me. This is what the, the best I've just had this year because I, I now we have this um, heat wave in our greenhouses. And usually what I do, I continue feeding, opening, open the tank to feed um, uh, the I nutrient. Just the plant. I just wasted it. And, and, and I'm looking at what, how to save cost. And this will help us, sir. Meaning yeah, early it. morning, we can feed our nutrients. Then yeah. evening, we can Late feed nutrients. Yes. yes. So wow. In the day, just water and mist the environment. That's all. Wow. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Let me give the okay. other um, participants the opportunity to ask questions too, sir. We Thank have you, three sir. more minutes. Let's be fast. Thank you very much, sir, MD. So my name is Hussein. I'm joining from Lagos. Uh, I just have a follow-up question on your response to Mr. Obina. Yes, it's clear that you have given um, insights on how to regulate pH level, whether to increase or decrease. But when he asked, when Mr. Obina asked about his own consistent lowered pH, you suggested a kind of like relatively permanent solution. So is, can, it, can that be a solution for the other way around too? Maybe when the pH level is also constantly high. So rather than, of course, you have talked about the mixing of water, you've talked about the ratio, I got that, but where you talked about the other relatively permanent solution to increase it, is there for the other way around too, when it's constantly high? Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. So when the um, the pH is constantly uh, alkaline, what you need to do is to also have a buffer tank. And the only way to buffer, to reduce it, is to add acid. Um, I've not tested any cheap pH lowering 
uh, thing like we have the oyster shell on. I don't have one in my head, but be careful with what you use. Let me give you an example. Those days we were using alum to correct pH. Sincerely, alum will do it, but it will kill your plant because aluminium is toxic. It lowers your pH, but kills the plant. You understand? So be careful for acid, nitric acid. Nitric acid, very good because it also adds nitrogen. Phosphoric acid, very good. It also adds phosphate. Sulfuric acid adds sulfate. The only that your plant only needs a little amount of sulfate. But sulfuric acid is the cheapest. It's your normal battery water. Just buy four liter keg. That four liter keg can, you know, buffer 10, 20,000 liter of water, if not more self, depending on. So that's the only way I think you can bring down the, the uh, pH when it is more alkaline. It is human being that need alkaline pH. Alkaline pH help oxygen to move well in the bloodstream for human being. But remember, plant is the reverse. I hope I answered you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate it. You're welcome. And um, Mr. Subar also gives uh, Abi, Mr. Somotola gives an idea. So when you monitor all your parameter, hygrometer is what you use to check your relative humidity. You can, it's available. Just get it from from meat. Um, we don't have, but I know it's available. And you can call for there. They can also help you get to check your humidity. So if you pour water on the floor of your greenhouse, it also helps in cooling down the temperature. It lowers the temperature and it also increases humidity, which is true. So that misting is the best way to, to do that. But if you don't have a mister, that's a very good idea. Please just follow it. Pour water on the floor from time to time. And as it's evaporating, it's increasing the humidity in the environment. So um, I am confused there. You said hydroponic solution A and B while last from Mr. John. I think I have two different solution tank for those two compounds. Does that mean we will mix those nutrients on two different tanks and supply to the plant? Uh, I'm sure, are you the one that attended the training? Because if you are the one, you should know, yes, you need two tanks to mix nutrients. You don't, at the concentrator level, you don't mix them together. That we did well in the training. We shouldn't, I don't want to be going to basics again. So yes, it's, it's you have two tanks, nitrate based and others. You have two tanks. At the concentrated level you mix, when you now, when you are feeding, they join together, they hardly from precipitation when they are moving into your plant. So you don't mix stock of these two together. If you have one tank, all you need to do is first mix one, make sure it's fully diluted, and then you mix the rest, add it in this, your major fatigation tank and feed to the plant. But at the concentrated level, you don't mix the two together. It will give you issue. That's what we said. I hope Mr. Freeman got that. I don't want you to be confused. Did you get that? Okay, okay, okay. So yeah, thank you everyone. Um, uh, great to have us. Uh, till we meet again for another session, a refresher or whatever we call it. Uh, thanks for joining. Send your email to the lines that were posted so that you can get this recording. And then we will meet next time. Our training for this month comes up online and then 
on site, you have somebody you want to recommend and all that, please feel free to do that. And the the promo for our, our salad promo is almost ending. So you can still take advantage of it. Till we meet again. Uh thank you. I leave and I leave it to the moderator. Femi, do we still have anything or we close the session? You can stop the recording and then I think okay. end the session. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks for the eye opening and the wonderful lecture. God bless you, sir. Right. So I think we can close. You can end the session.